Betty, we are so excited to be here with you today. We have Dr. Christopher Gardner with us, and we're going to go through his bio in a little bit. He really prefers to be called Christopher, so we will be referring to him as such. But before we get to talking about um, his expert guidance to nutrition controversies, we're going to have Amy talk to us a little bit about our chat. Go ahead and tell us where you're from, what you've been up to, what your name is, whatever you'd like to in the chat. And I see people already joining in there saying hello from Florida, from Maryland, from Atlanta, Las Vegas. And that is the beauty of technology is that we can all join together um, digitally for a great presentation today. Of course, this is technology. So we sometimes can have challenges as well. Each of us are in three different states. Um, so you just never know what's gonna happen. So if we have issues ourselves, give us a moment, let us refresh, come back. Um, someone will always be with you throughout this process, um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we won't have any issues. So um, thank you for being here today. And if you have questions during the time, the chat place is the, is the place to ask those. I'll flag those so that we can answer those at the end during our Q&A time. Well, thank you for that, Amy. So at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Gardner. Of course, some of us are familiar with him and his work a little bit because of the Netflix documentary on the twin studies, which was a lot of fun to watch. But Dr. Christopher Gardner is also a professor of medicine at Stanford and nutrition scientist and studies what to consume and to avoid for optimal health and how to best motivate healthy behavior change, especially in the dietary field. He is currently chair of the American Heart Association's Nutrition Committee and serves on the 2025 U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. He has conducted and published dozens of human nutrition trials. And for the past 13 years, he has coordinated a summer farm camp for children in Sunnyvale in collaboration with the Santa Clara Unified School District and now with the Ardmore Institute of Health. And we are so excited to have you here with us today. I can't wait to learn from you. All right. <clears throat> I'm super informal, so really feel like uh, <laughs> interrupt me anywhere along the way. I'm just going to have some fun. I guess Excellent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot for about 45 minutes of talking, but it might be 40 or 35. I brought an extra 50 slides to ask to answer additional questions. So I'll call those out at the end. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Thanks to everybody in my group. Here's my research group having a potluck. And one of my colleagues, Justin Sonnenberg and his wife, Erica, run a lab about the microbiome. And I get funding from lots of people, the National Institute of Health, the American Heart Association, Association and Ardmore. How about that? That's pretty cool. So here's an outline of what I thought I would get through. I see already a question, seniors need more protein. Oh, I can't wait to answer protein questions at the end because I'm not going to answer them in the middle. So I've been involved with a lot of these groups. Actually, I'm not directly involved with Cancer Society, but uh, I've worked with the other three. And if you just look at what cancer suggests as a dietary approach, choose most of the stuff you get from plants. Limit the things you get from an animal. So that doesn't mean vegan or vegetarian. It just means have a lot of plants for the most part. And if you were to move over to the American Heart Association that I work a lot with, this is their 2021 update of their dietary guidance. And, okay, wait, my little thing moved. Uh oh, oh, no, there it's back, okay. So here's, a list of 10-ish recommendations that they have. And I thought it'd help you just a little and circle these ones up top. You're gonna to be stunned that American Heart says you should eat more veggies and fruits, more whole grains, not refined grains, and get a lot of your protein from plants, legumes and nuts. And it goes on and on, fish and seafood and avoid soda. But those are the top ones. And I wanted to point out that in my field of nutrition over the last 30 years has been a shift. At first, we were all trying to figure out what nutrients were the ones to avoid for bad health and to include for good health. And then we realized people didn't go to the grocery store to shop for nutrients. They tried to shop for foods. So then we shifted a little more toward foods. And then and we found a lot of people gaming the system. So I'd meet somebody who said, yeah, doc, I'm, I'm on a Mediterranean diet. 
Billy, what'd you have today? Well, I had an Egg McMuffin for breakfast, a Big Mac for lunch, and a Whopper for dinner. I'd say, well, it doesn't really sound Mediterranean at all. Oh, yeah. I got a jigger of olive oil in my nightstand. And before I go to bed, I chug that olive oil because I know that's what the Mediterranean diet is. It's all about olive oil. Okay, so Americans are sometimes ridiculously clever at gaming the system here. And so now we have a move toward patterns. So a Mediterranean diet pattern really is more than olive oil or DASH, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension or pescatarian or things like that. So I actually was asked to chair a writing committee to rank popular dietary patterns to see how well they aligned those American Heart Association guidelines. And we just published this last year and we made a heat map here. And on the left, these were all the categories that the American Heart Association suggested were beneficial for protecting your heart. And across the top, it's probably too small, but I didn't really mean for you to read it. You don't have to. Were all the different dietary patterns we had. And we had a, a legend, which is, might be covered up, it is for me. And if it was green, you got a point for being adherent and aligned to American heart and red you weren't and yellow and gray were kind of in the middle and so the quick take-home point for all this is we sort of divided them up into three tiers very adherent pretty adherent not so adherent needs some work and really not adherent at all and in tier one was this dietary approaches to stop hypertension and Mediterranean and pescatarian and several kinds of vegetarian diet and then lower tiers for other diets. But I do wanna say full plate living is totally aligned with these. Full plate living would totally go in tier one. So I'm on board with Ardmore. Okay, let's go next. It's funny, my little arrows disappear every once in a while, Michelle and Amy, but it's back. I also helped with the diabetes folks. So I helped with their 2019 update of nutrition therapy for diabetes and pre-diabetes, and they came up with their own plate. So there's non-starchy vegetables and the carb foods. This looks like potatoes and fruits in here and protein foods and a glass of water with no calories. So that was their rendition of a plate. I thought I would compare that to the dietary guidelines for Americans. So this is interesting, I'm currently serving on the advisory committee for the new, what will be updated dietary guidelines in 2025. So do you see any differences here? You know, this was originally the pyramid, the diet pyramid in 1992. And then they realized, well, there's sort of more than one pyramid. And so they made mypyramid.gov. I don't know how many of you ever saw that. You could say how old you were, how active, male or female, and, then you could come up with my pyramid, which is a little more tailored to you, but you do notice some differences here, right? Wow, Teresa gave me a thumbs down on, uh, I think the dietary guidelines. So it was kind of funny when these came out, the Harvard School of Health, Public Health said, well, yeah, there's something to this, but we would suggest some recommendations. How about this plate? So it shouldn't take long to see what the differences are, but. Let me start with a subtle one. And this is a pet peeve of mine. I always say vegetables first and fruits second, veggies and fruits. And it doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. But why do you think they flipped them? Look, over here, it's fruits and veggies. I don't know if you read an order. Is there an order? And over here, it's veggies and fruits. So I actually like that little, little tweak right there. I personally find that gratifying. Okay. And then... For grains, they said whole grains. Now, if you read the MyPlate guidelines, it says at least half your grains should be whole grains, but Harvard puts it right out there. They should be whole grains. And proteins here, they should be healthy proteins. And for a lot of people, they don't think of beans and legumes. And wow, those are some very high fiber, very ardmore consistent sources of protein. So that's very consistent with American Heart. So some little tweaks in the middle here, but the funniest one is the dairy versus the water. And that Harvard wants you to pour oil on things so you can get a more Mediterranean diet. So there's some differences there, right? And there's Ardmore. It's, it's got three quarters of the plate is these plants. And then you can have some meat in there. It's not vegan or vegetarian. The point is improve your nutrition by adding fiber-rich foods. It's, 
it's a simple message. It's great. And it's really consistent with a lot of these other patterns. So really like that. Happy to be here talking to all you folks who must be Ardmore fans. I guess that's how you're here. So let's move on from sort of agreement among national health organizations. I'm, I'm gonna bring that up in the beginning because I participate in social media and it seems like from social media and even traditional media, it often seems like none of the nutrition scientists agree. And what's staggering to me is when I work with American Heart or Dietary Guidelines or diabetes or other ones that I'm part of, if you get us all in the same room together and we're all looking at the same research papers, we pretty much agree on everything. I really think that the social influencers are making too much of a case of controversy and discrepancy just to get everybody riled up. I guess maybe that's more fun than it's boring to say, yeah, have fiber and have vegetables, but you know, being contentious is, is disruptive. It's not helpful. Okay, so here's one of the ways I think of a foundational diet, right? So across all those patterns that we looked at in American Heart, even the ones that we didn't like, even the ones that weren't top notch in our scoring system, all of them said more vegetables, more whole foods, less added sugars, less refined grains, and less processed foods. All of them, all of them in that whole set. And you know what? Americans aren't good at any of those. It's not like, duh, those are the best ones, and we already do that. No, let me go back a quick slide. Americans are not good at any of these. As a whole, not you, I know that as part of this group that you do better than that. But Americans, don't you know some neighbors out there? Okay, so your friends, neighbors, talk to them. After that initial core, where honestly we get every, every kind of every kind of vegetable, every kind of natural recommendation or, or popular diet recommendation, I can think of it here as to these. I think there's really quite a bit of agreement around this next line. Everyone has dis detractors, right? I'm sure you've heard of the guy who thinks beans will kill you because of the lectins in them. And that people with uh, problems controlling their blood glucose are worried about the sugars in fruits and the low fat zealots are worried that fats have nuts and the vegans and the vegetarians are worried about the eggs and all their cholesterol and uh, the vegetarians really don't like it when you eat something with a face. So there's all those reasons for that, but but really, Honestly, the lectins, if you cook the beans, you don't really have many problems with the lectins and beans are a powerhouse of fiber and protein and nutrients. So by missing out on the lectins, you'd be missing out on so much more. That's ridiculous. Yes, fruits have sugars, but when it's embedded in the food matrix, the release of the sugars into your blood is much slower than if it's an added sugar. Wow, fruits are a great source of energy and nutrients. Nuts, oh my gosh, fats in nuts. Nuts have protein, nuts have good unsaturated fat for the most part. American Heart Association loves unsaturated fat, that's great. Eggs, oh my God, You're, I'm gonna go off on a little egg rant a little bit later, but I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of cholesterol metabolism. If you want me to come back, I'll do that, but that takes an hour, I'm gonna skip that, really? It's actually more the saturated fat in your diet than the cholesterol in the eggs in your diet that ends up as blood cholesterol. It might sound like a little bit of a disconnect, but if you ever wanna know, or after my talk, I'll explain why saturated fat in your diet's worse for blood cholesterol than cholesterol itself in eggs. And fish, that's where they have you know the omega-3s. Uh, we gotta avoid overfishing. So we are crippling some of the world's resources of fish, but if you did fish right in moderation, it would be good. And then go to another outer rim here, right? So grains and poultry, I definitely hear more people arguing about those, but what if I stepped this up and I said, not just grains, but whole intact grains? Because I think the issue here is the donuts and cookies and refined bread and flour, we're not keen on those, but still cut oats, brown rice, I make a kick butt wheat berry salad, a barley soup, those are all powerfully nutritious. And for poultry, are we talking Kentucky Fried Chicken? Raised in a concentrated animal feeding operation and stuffed with antibiotics, that is, that's way different than animals that are raised more in their own domain, their, the way they were evolved. 
And then maybe finally, I, I do think the most contentious is both dairy and red meat. We do know that 75% of the world is lactose intolerant. So you don't need dairy. But again, if we if if we put this in context of what these really are, is Gogur really have any dairy in it? I'm not sure. I, I bet it does. I bet if I look at the directions, it does. But it's a lot of sugar. And how about cheese whiz? And yes, you can have some ice cream once in a while, but please not the whole tub of ice cream. Yogurt, especially plain, and hard cheeses are pretty good sources of nutrition. If we're not talking about hot dogs or processed hot dogs, again, we've got regenerative farming, pasture-raised red meat. And I, I'm bringing this all up to suggest that if we really put the foods in front of us, most people, even though they favor very different popular diets, would be largely in agreement. But a lot of these issues are made out to be contentious. These are the ones I wish we would focus on more, given that every single group I know agrees with this and there's huge room for improvement. Let's fix this first, and then maybe we can tackle some of the other things because there's even considerable agreement across all those other fields. So this is a favorite publication of mine from a few years back that I really think captures an important piece of American dietary habit here. So. Instead of just talking about carbs, proteins, and fats, let's talk about subtypes of carbs, proteins, and fats. So I'm going to start over here on the right with the fat. So there's monounsaturated and poly, and these are sort of the percentage of calories we get from each of those. This is from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. This is something that goes on every year all around the country. And so each one of them, can you allow me to just sort of round up here. Each one of them contributes about 10% of calories and we get about 30% of calories from fat. And then we got animal and plant protein. Well, I'm not gonna talk a lot about plant protein, but I would love to rant on that later if you want. I'm a huge fan of plant protein, but look, I don't know if it's fair to round that one up to 10, but let's say these are both 10-ish for animal and plant protein. And let's go over to carbs. And so for high quality carbs, Americans eat about 10% of their calories. And if I just lump those first set together, it's kind of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, everything about 10. What is the obvious elephant in the room? It's the crap. It's the added sugars and the refined grains and the cookies and the chips and the pastries and the desserts and the candies and the it's not even fair, it's like 40%. So this particular paper said, look, we're doing better. We brought it down from 45 to 42. And my take on this is, holy crap, this is the big problem, obviously right here. It's all the snack foods of simple sugars that flood into our bloodstream quickly, give us insulin spikes, lead to prediabetes, then to diabetes, then to cardiovascular disease. So. That's it. That's the thing we've got to work on the most. And look what Ardmore says. Yes, fiber-rich meals will be down here. High-quality carbs. That's it. So we got to increase this. I guess my question is, should all of the low-quality carbs be replaced with high-quality carbs? That would be kind of a low-fat diet and a high-carb diet. Or should it be keto or paleo where you take all the low-quality carbs and make them fat? saturated and mono and polyunsaturated fat. I actually think if I had a hundred of you and I got to work on you on your diet, I bet you I could find five out of the hundred that would do well if they replaced all these low quality carbs with high quality. And I could find another five that would do well if they replaced all of that with some kind of fat. But that would leave 90% of you. And so what I really think the solution here is replace some of these added sugars and refined grains with good quality carbohydrates and replace some of them with nuts, fatty fish, avocados. And I think for most people, a balance of getting rid of these and adding carbs and fats back would be best. Uh, again, I don't have time to show you, but people's protein doesn't change much. Almost everybody's diet in America, other than vegans and vegetarians, which are a little lower, are about 18% protein. And it hardly varies at all. So I think when you do cut back on these, it'll be mostly carbs and fats that you replace it with. Maybe you can ask me more later. So here's how I approach it when somebody is saying something controversial out there and I'm 
frustrated and I say, oh, you know, show me the evidence. Oh, wow, you found a research paper that said yes, and you found a research paper that said no. And I say, well, try looking for a little more context because I think when you get enough context in this, things don't really break out into good and evil. It's a false dichotomy. It really depends on the context. And I hope with what or instead of what would help you. In fact, I'm working on a book right now. I'm talking to my editor tomorrow about how to build out this with what instead of what concept. So tell me if you like this. Give me helpful feedback for my book. Let's talk about eggs and let's talk about them with cheese. Okay, that's different than just eggs. That's cheesy eggs. I think some people like cheesy eggs better than plain eggs. And how about cheesy eggs that are scrambled with bacon and sausage? Isn't that kind of an iconic American breakfast? Boy, that's got a lot of saturated fat in it. How about a veggie omelet? Ah, look at all the veggies in there. Okay, this is an egg? Yeah, and it's got fruit on the same plate. Oh my gosh, I'm kind of loving this option here. So those are with what? With eggs, with bacon and sausage, with veggies and fruit, or instead of what? How about instead of eggs for breakfast, you have steel cut oats with nuts, blueberries, kiwi. Ah, oh, boy, any health professional that I know would encourage you to enjoy this. And how about this? If the context is instead of Pop-Tarts, isn't just about anything better than a Pop-Tart? Oh my God. I just saw a Netflix movie called Frosting last night which is sort of a mockery of the evolution of Pop-Tarts. Um, it was pretty funny. I don't know if I'm going to recommend it or not. But for the sake of my discussion today, this is a horrible question. Are eggs good or bad? I, I've been teaching human nutrition to Stanford students for almost 25 years. I get this kind of question all the time. And my answer is always, it depends. You have got to give me more context. So with what and instead of what, or compared to what? So let's say compared to Pop-Tarts. I actually think all of these are better than Pop-Tarts, even the cheesy eggs with the bacon and sausage. This is just sugar and refined grain, which I already pointed out is America's biggest problem. But what if we were just saying eggs with bacon and sausage or with cheese or with veggies? I would totally pick the veggies. That would be their better one. So this is, oh, got more fiber. There's no fiber in there. There's no fiber in there. There's a lot of fiber in there and the fruit has some fiber, right? Okay, well, how about, you know, completely instead of the eggs at all, we just have this whole food plant-based oatmeal, steel cut oats. All right, so pretend that you were somebody who had listened to me and you said, ah, oh, Christopher, man, I heard that talk you gave to Ardmore and I totally bought that whole thing. I went home and I had steel cut oats every day, Monday through Saturday and it's Sunday now. I'm trying to figure out if I should have them again or if I should try something different. Okay, you really should have something different. You need more variety in life than having steel cut oats every single day for breakfast. That's ridiculous. So let's pretend I sent that person home and they came back a week later and said, oh, thank God you cleared that up for me. Okay, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I had the steel cut oats and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I had the veggie omelet, but I'm, I still don't know what to have doc for Sunday. What should I do there? Okay, you may not believe this. You could even have the God dang Pop-Tarts on Sunday, seriously. So think about it. If you ate this well, six days a week, look at all that fiber. You're eating really highly nutritious foods. You can have fun every once in a while. Isn't there a birthday party every once in a while or a celebration? You don't have to be perfect, but America is far from perfect. America eats more like Pop-Tarts six days a week and once a month has steel cut oats and once a month has these. So, you know, what if what if you have a childhood memory of one of your parents making Pop-Tarts for you before you went out for a, a hike and somehow that emotionally is very soothing and calming for you? Yeah, there's more to food than just nutrition, right? And it's sitting down with family and maybe somebody doesn't cook in the house, but they're really proud that they made you Pop-Tarts or maybe as a kid, you toasted a Pop-Tart and you were so excited that you made your own food. Okay, but not all the time, just every once in a while. So are eggs evil? Are they good? Are they better? Are they worse? It 
I really need the context. And I hope if you think about that with what instead of what, you can answer a bunch of your own questions when you think, oh yeah. In that context, I was thinking my friend was eating horribly or I made a good or bad choice, but you're right. There's a better choice or there's a worse choice and context really matters. I'll tell you how the American Heart Association has moved forward to this. So they don't even have anymore a specific number of milligrams of dietary cholesterol to look for. So this is a 2020 review. And they said, you know, a recommendation that gives a specific cholesterol target, that's really hard for even clinicians to do and consumers to implement. So their new guidance is focused on the dietary pattern. And the dietary patterns are DASH or Mediterranean or pescatarian or vegetarian. That's more likely to improve diet quality and promote cardiovascular health. And it, it will be low in cholesterol because you follow the whole dietary pattern advice. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna go on unapologetic deliciousness now because after many, many years of teaching nutrition and really loving metabolism, I am a geek. I really love the whole metabolism thing. But at the end of the day, I kind of forgot how important it is for food to taste good. So if you're trying to get somebody to switch, you can't say, I, I used to do a lot of studies that would lower cholesterol. And I'm making fun of myself. I really didn't do this exactly, but I'd be done with my study and I'd say, oh, this is fantastic. I lowered your cholesterol with cardboard. I want you to go out there and eat cardboard. And I'm, I'm sorry, cardboard doesn't taste very good. And I, I can just kind of remember my face scrunching up apologetically. And I started hanging out with some chefs and they said, why are you apologizing? Oh, we're chefs. We make everything taste delicious. We can make plant food taste delicious. So they have got me on this unapologetic deliciousness rant here. About 11, 12 years ago, the School of uh, Public Health at Harvard and the Culinary Institute of America started the Menus of Change. And they have an annual meeting. And their vision was that, well, they're chefs, so they wanted to make delicious food. But they said, you know, we can make it nutritious and healthy and environmentally stable, stable sustainable, and be socially responsible and ethical at the same time. I love that. Okay, I'm going to end on that note eventually. Don't you want to have this? This uh, Greg Drescher is the one who came up with this idea for unapologetic deliciousness. The relentless pursuit of deliciousness at the intersection of health, sustainability, culture, and innovation. Ah, that is inspiring, right? Oh my gosh. Okay. I want unapologetic deliciousness. Well, Harvard hangs out with the main campus of the Culinary Institute of America, but they have a satellite campus in the Napa Valley where wine country is, which is just north of Stanford. And so we hang out with them and we came up with this spinoff, the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. And we've been working with the dining halls, a sort of a living laboratory about how to think about taste and health and the environment. And here's a research paper that we published that won't take long to explain. It will be kind of obvious, I hope. We actually got multiple universities to participate in this. We went to the dining halls and I know Stanford's best on a given academic quarter, there's about 17 different vegetables that they rotate through. They have two or three every day and every few weeks, some of them come back and they have lots of names for them. And so there's a guy named Dan Jurafsky, who's a linguistics professor at Stanford, and he focuses on food words. And Ali Crum, who's the senior author of this and a professor of psychology, focuses on mindsets. Like, I have a mindset that I don't like veggies because they're squishy and they're not very tasty. And he said, ah, let's work with the chefs and make some unapologetically delicious vegetable dishes. And let's give them crazy fun names so that the students will try them. We'll see if we can break that mindset. So for each one of the vegetables, they got three different names that kept rotating through the academic quarter. There's either a health focused or a basic name or a taste focused name. And just as an example, using carrots, let's try this. Basic was just carrots. Taste focused was indulgent, twisted citrus glazed carrots. And the health focus was either high fiber carrots, that's presence of a glorified nutrient, or low sodium carrots, that's absence of a vilified uh, component. Okay, the key to the whole study was 
The labeling changed, but the recipe didn't. It was the same recipe. All I did was change the names of the veggies. And the take home point of this main result paper is that compared to the basic, the taste focused one increased like 25% just by changing the name. Okay, but this is crushing, personally crushing for my career where I understand the metabolism of fiber and low sodium and how beneficial they are for your health. And when they named them, named them high fiber or low sodium, the students <laughs> took less than if you just named them carrots. Isn't this an added value? Oh my God, this is America. America has decided ahead of time it's their mindset that health doesn't taste good. Oh, this is so crushing. Okay, there's a little there's a little aside to this story, which is of all the universities who did this, one of the university scores were kind of out of whack with the others, and they didn't line up. And the reviewers of our paper before we published it suggest we go back and figure this one thing out: why their scores were so much lower. And it's a little too complicated a test, but to to explain. But when they tested it, it turned out the one university's recipes, none of them were very good. They were all worse. You can't just say twisted citrus glazed carrots and have crappy carrots and have people like them. Yes, you can change the name, but it does have to taste good. And then if it tastes good and you have this in there, it's even better. We now have a website called the Edgy Veggie Toolkit. And it was developed collectively by these universities so that dining folks can go in and apply the edgy veggie approach and give things cool names to get people to eat more. Because look, it works. You just, it's the same recipe and you name it something else. Oh my God. Okay, so I've been having with chefs, go out there and hug a chef. They really do a lot of great things for us out there. I've been running studies, and this is the latest study that we ran. I'm going to guess some of you saw the trailer. Maybe some of you even saw it. It turns out several hundred million people have watched this now. It was number three on Netflix for a while. It was the whole idea came from Luis Ahoyos, who had an award, Oscar award winning documentary back in, let's say, 2009, and also did a really cool thing with vegan athletes in the game changers with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jackie Chan. Okay, we had a hypothesis that if identical twins got randomized to eat a healthy vegan versus a healthy omnivorous diet for eight weeks, the vegans would improve in some things. Blood cholesterol was our main outcome, but we looked at lots of other things. And so here's a picture of the design where of the eight weeks, for four of them, we had food delivered to them because we thought, oh, the vegans, it's gonna take them a while to learn how to be vegan. Ah. Maybe not. Maybe if we deliver it, they'll figure it out right away and then they'll cook on their own. So four weeks of food delivery and four weeks of providing food to them. And this is not chocolate ice cream. This is poop. So I work with a microbiologist and I get poop for him and he does that. And I get blood and send it off for cholesterol and other things. And we get diet records from them of the things that they were eating. That's how the study was designed. And this is very important to me. So I said, we randomized to vegan or omnivore. And I'll tell you one cheating way to make this work, if you wanted to, is to make a crappy omnivorous diet and a good vegan diet. So this is a scale of a healthy eating index. It's kind of cut off to help show the differences here. It really does go to zero to, from zero to 100. I'm only gonna show you from 50 to 80. And here's the two groups, and here's what they scored according to a validated thing called the healthy eating index. So they were like 50, 55 in the beginning. And I want to show you what Americans typically do. This is the same thing. I think this is in Haynes. Anyway, this is a diet from the Dietary Guidelines for American Publication. It's the healthy eating index score on a scale of zero to 100. Here's how America has been doing between this 10 year period, they went from 56 to seven to nine to 60 to drop back down and they can't really seem to bust much past 60, which is it obvious? There's still a lot of room for improvement, a lot of room for more fiber right there. And I wanted to bring that up because our group was maybe eating a little unhealthier than the American diet. So they had room for improvement, but they both did better. When we delivered food to these omnivores, we delivered food that was healthier for them than they had been eating before. 
And when they were on their own, they both slipped a little bit. But this is important. At the end of eight weeks, they were still eating a healthier diet than they had been eating before the study started, even the omnivores. You do actually get a bunch of points for fiber. So the vegans were getting a lot of fiber. And that's part of the reason for that difference there. Okay. So do you want to know what happened after eight weeks with 22 pairs of identical twins going one way or the other? Well, the main outcome for the study was listed as LDL cholesterol, and it went down in the vegans, and it kind of stayed the same for the omnivores. And according to scientific geekiness, this is a probability less than 5%, basically 2%, which means it qualifies as being statistically significant. And then we looked at a lot of other things. Most of them were not significant, but they did have lower fasting insulin levels and the vegans lost a little bit of weight. And not on this particular chart are a couple other things that are in other research papers generated from the study. They had telomere length um, was longer in the vegans. That's sort of a sign of biological age. That means the vegans were technically a little younger then they're identical twins at the end of the eight weeks. We have a biological clock that we looked at epigenetically that made it look like the vegans were a little younger than their omnivore identical twins. And we saw some microbiome changes that were positive and those are being written up. Good changes in the microbiome, the bugs that are in your colon and the metabolites, the things that the microbiome releases into your bloodstream. Those are all underway. So they're, the only thing that was worse for the vegans was B12. From a dietary perspective, they weren't getting enough B12. You'd have to get that from somewhere else because B12 comes primarily from animal sources. So at the end of the day, we published this in a very high-end journal, the Journal of American Medical Association. We got rave um, public coverage of this. And we concluded that a healthy vegan diet led to improved cardiometric metabolic outcomes compared to a healthy omnivorous diet. That's important to me. Not crap, but a healthy comparison diet. I want to give a shout out to all the amazing people whose names are above, but these are their fabulous faces, everybody analyzing data, collecting poop, collecting blood, etc. Mm. And we had been filmed this whole time that we were doing the study and the director was off filming a bunch of other stuff. I didn't even know all the other stuff that he was filming. And I knew there was a contract with Netflix to release this on January 1st, but I almost forgot about it because I was so caught up in our study and the that we were giving. So I was away on vacation. And a couple of days after January 1st, my wife said, quick, quick, come out here and look at this. You're on TV. Oh my God, how cool. And we were third on Netflix. Okay, that was really quite a surprise. We really didn't expect that. So that was a very interesting experience to have me make fun of the standard American diet and work with, here's a bunch of the twins. This is only 10 pairs. Aren't they adorable? They were so fun to work with. Oh my God, they finish each other's sentences. They usually dress alike. Can you tell for this particular picture? They had all the vegans dressed in green and all the carnivores dressed in red. Because honestly, when they would come up to us, we could not tell who was who because they were identical, right? We didn't know what to call them. But Louis, the director, had gone out and he got the Sonnenbergs to do their microbiome thing, but he also got a high-end chef in New York, Senator Cory Booker, Mayor Eric Adams, a chicken farmer, a beef rancher, a woman who lives next to a concentrated animal feeding operation, a lawyer, a public health person, a nutrition professional. The NRDC was, it was amazing, all the things that he put in this documentary. And I'm sure that's why it did so well. He actually offered a number of different perspectives. I, my e email inbox was filled for months. In fact, it, I still get emails to this day, months and months later, mostly thanking me for the Netflix thing, but often, not often, occasionally criticizing me. But this is my favorite email, or actually this is an email. This is a social media thing. This is on Twitter. And this is a Harvard professor who wrote, the twin experiment on Netflix is probably one of the best pieces of SciComm I have seen to date. Most people have no idea what, that they are watching science communication at work. And that's why she thought it was so good. And this was part of what I call a tutorial where it's the first line of many things. And so she actually wrote a bunch of stuff. So if you really dug into it, 
what you ended up finding out was she was one of the investigators responsible for getting the Moderna COVID vaccine approved and out to the public. And this little write-up here sort of expresses her frustration that, wow, they got that COVID vaccine out so fast, and yet a bunch of people wouldn't take it. They were afraid of it. They thought there were things in it. They thought it was killing people. And so her idea was, you know, we really need to make science communication more accessible to people and even just plain entertaining. So this is, I was really proud of getting this email about the study that got featured in Netflix, which kind of dumbed it down and actually got a couple of things wrong about the study. But as a whole, hundreds of millions of people saw it and it was science. So I'm really thrilled about that part. So to wrap up and give you guys time for questions, because I've been having a hard, Amy, man, good luck following those all those um, posts in the chat. I'm dying to hear how you summarize that. My goal at the end of the day is I'm a nutrition scientist. I would like things to be healthy and nutritious, but I know people like to eat great tasting food and I don't wanna take that away from you. I have a lot of Stanford students that are very much into environmental sustainability and social justice. And so my goal, and I do think this is aligned with Ardmore, is this idea that there's an aspirational diet that hits all of those angles. And that's really what I'm after in the long run. And one of those projects is a summer food and farm camp that we run at the Santa Clara Unified School District where Stanford students are the counselors of the camp. So we recruit or we advertise just for a fun camp, come to farm camp and chase chickens and ride on the tractor. And they have to do some errands too. They have to water the things and weed plants and things like that. But it's also a cooking camp. So they're encouraged uh, to, to cook. And actually, you're going to get a link pretty soon of uh, we were two minutes of a documentary done by Michael Pollan for a book he wrote called In Defense of Food. And it's all about the kids cooking for a sort of a pizza runoff. But here are these Stanford students. And I, I have to say, I love watching the kids try more and more vegetables and try cooking them and seasoning them and having fun. But a little side fact, little unknown fact here is how much the Stanford students get changed when they spend a summer with kids eating vegetables. Um, their, their attitude changes too. So these are, a couple of these went to med school, a couple of these went into sustainable food programs. One of them ended up being a farmer. He was going to be, you know, a cosmetic surgeon and own a BMW. And instead he ended up being a farmer. Linda Coe is, uh, has been a postdoctoral research fellow with us for a while. And she applied to the Ardmore Institute of Health and got money to help support this, where we are trying to build full plate living into what the camp does and into what the Santa Clara Unified School District does for all 35,000 kids in their school district. She is about to leave us and become a professor at Amherst College in Massachusetts. But I've got to thank Linda for a lot of work at farm camp and Ardmore for allowing that type of thing to happen. Nailing it right here. I got 15 minutes left for questions. And Perfect timing. I know. Wasn't that pretty good? I'm a professional. Very good. I do have to say I very much enjoyed watching the slides and I have giggled quite a bit. I've enjoyed watching the conversations in the chat as well. And we do have some very good questions. So one that was interesting and you don't have to take a super long answer, but is fiber really necessary? Uh, technically, it's kind of funny. So there's no, um, when you talk about essential nutrients, technically fiber isn't because you never use it. You put it in your mouth and it comes out your butt. Right. Um, <laughs> so in that regard, I saw that one going by, Michelle, and I cracked up. I was actually hoping that you would <laughs> ask me that. I so, did too. Okay, but what we're learning now that was underappreciated before was the role of fiber in the microbiome. So because fiber, fiber is basically carbohydrate. It's long strings of carbohydrate-like molecules that unless you make them small enough to absorb in your small intestine, they just keep going down the intestinal tract. But it turns out the bugs, the bacteria, the microbes in your colon 
have a thousand enzymes that will break apart carbohydrates, whereas humans only have a couple. And they use that for fuel. And they generate metabolic byproducts that we are now learning go and get absorbed in the colon, into the bloodstream, improve immune function, lower cholesterol. And in the absence of fiber, it turns out that we have a lining, a mucus slimy lining in our intestinal tract that protects us from nasty things. And it's made of carbohydrate. And the microbes in the colon will start eating the lining of your intestine if you don't give them enough fiber. And we think that's one of the causes of leaky gut syndrome, which some people suffer from, which is really painful GI mm -hmm. distress. So there's one angle where fiber is not necessary and another one where Ardmore is dead on. There's like, there's, there's nothing fiber does wrong. Fiber is fabulous. Everybody should get more. Excellent. Thank you. The next question actually answers two, maybe three or more of our questions. Please help me sort out the protein requirements for people over 50, particularly the notion that plant proteins are not as bioavailable as animal proteins. So you did say you were willing to go a little bit more into the whole <laughs> plant protein issue. Yeah. And I think what most people are asking, because there's multiple questions about this, is <laughs> You know, as I age, do I really need more protein? And does plant protein still count? Am I am I getting enough if I'm eating plant protein? Yeah. So as we age, sometimes our ability to absorb nutrients goes down. Uh, another issue that's that's hard to tease apart. There's something called sarcopenia, which is a muscle loss, and that mm -hmm. some people attribute to protein because there's so much protein in muscle. But a lot of sarcopenia in older adults is also due to hormonal changes. It's also due to loneliness and dentition issues. So they're not as hungry. They're not eating as much. Uh, if you look at the dietary guidelines for the protein requirements and recommendations, they do not change after 18 years old. There mm -hmm. are groups who say, oh my God, the recommended daily allowance for most adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. And I know I should translate that to pounds. I think that's actually 0.36 grams per pound. Um, there's a lot of folks who say that should go up by a 15 or 20%, at least for older adults. I don't really see anything wrong with that. Part of my point here will be that what most Americans don't appreciate is that most Americans get way more protein than that anyway. They, they already get the level that an athlete should get. There's protein in everything. And part of the answer to that is plants have more protein than people think. So yes, to answer the second question, if you just Google Gardner Protein Rant Stanford. Amy will get that for us. She'll I, like it. Oh, yeah. Amy told me she get this. So look for Zoe. Add Zoe to that. Um, I've had 1.4 million views of my protein rant. And it's real. plants are a little low in lysine if it's a grain and a little low in methionine if it's a bean. But they're not missing any of the amino acids. They have all 20. When you hear that ad that says quinoa, the only plant with all nine essential amino acids, that's bull ticky. They all <laughs> have all friggin' yeah. 20 amino acids and all friggin' nine essential amino acids. They have, I have graphs. I can show it. It's like publicly available data. It's a myth. Um, if you only ate plants, if you only ate rice all day, that was the only thing you had. If you only had beans all day, it would be a little tough to get all the protein you needed. But if you had reasonable variety in your diet, it's easy as an omnivore, as a vegetarian, it's pretty easy as a vegan. You'd have to work a little harder. If you're an older vegan, yeah, part of it is you'd have to be hungry. You'd have to work out enough to keep your muscle strength up. You have to work out enough and be physically active to get enough of a hunger and an appetite uh, and a need to keep those muscles taut and strong. So part of it is becoming more sedentary, becoming more lonely. So, and what's older? I assume Michelle older, older, older means older than me because I'm 65 now. Um, yes, so probably, probably that's the cutoff. Uh, I, I have been plant-based uh, for 41 years. So I really haven't had any chicken or fish. Uh, and for 15 years, haven't had any eggs or cheese or red meat. And I am showing no signs of falling over yet. I lead a pretty active lifestyle, but that's part of it. Part of it is keeping up that active lifestyle and enjoying the food that you're eating. 
Mm-hmm. And a lot of that culturally means there's a lot of cultures that thrive on beans. Beans are a staple. So that's the best plant-based. But have some eggs. Have some yogurt. Have some fish. Those are all great sources. You know, if I, I don't have those, but I'm perfectly fine with eggs, yogurt, and fish. Great sources of protein. Overall healthy. I think everybody agrees. I'm just doing an experiment on myself. Hope that helps. That was great. Thank you. This one's a little more edgy. How are hormones in our foods affecting our growth and longevity? Uh, Great question. You know, part of this is, is it the hormones in your food? Because you actually digest stuff and sort of neutralize a lot of it when you eat. Or you neutralize it when you cook. So you're not often eating a hormone that's functionally active that you absorb. It would be the hormones given to the animals. So part of this issue is, for those who don't recognize this, a lot of the concentrated animal feeding operations where massive amounts of animal are confined in one place so that we can have economically low-cost, efficient meats, they're given antibiotics prophylactically, which that means the animals aren't sick yet. They're just living in such tight quarters under such stress and biting one another and clawing and pecking. They give them these antibiotics and they give them at a sub-therapeutic dose, which means if they were sick, they'd get a much higher dose. But since they're not sick, they get a lower dose in their feed every single day. And it, it might help some of those issues I mentioned before, but it also leads to antibiotic resistance. What we get is superbugs being generated in these farming situations. And there's only so many antibiotics that we have to help humans when they get infections. And so this isn't a growth issue. This isn't a longevity issue. Well, it's longevity if you get an infection and and you uh, reject all the different antibiotics that are out there. So I think for the hormones, it's more the hormones they're giving the animals, which by the way, especially in chickens, it turns out, not only does it sort of help them keep healthier when they're all concentrated up, it makes them grow faster. Mm-hmm. And so the farmer can get more money per bird per pound by giving them antibiotics. So it sounds like a health thing, but it's really partly an economics thing. And it's it's kind of backfiring with antibiotic resistance. So I'm going to leave it that way. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification, though, because I think a lot of us It's so easy. And you touched on this a little bit, especially now with all the shorts on social media and all the influencers that just do a little thing, an alarming video about all the bad foods at Costco, all the bad foods here, all the bad foods there. So it's nice to get a clarification on some of these. Here's another one. Can you please clarify the dietary guidelines concerning fish versus seafood? Maybe like what, what's the difference there? Uh. Okay, this is so funny. So you're recording this, right? All right, so I don't know this. I'm on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee and I'm never allowed to say anything about my work, but I'm gonna gonna risk getting my wrist slapped here. We had that conversation this week (laughs) and it it was a really meaningless conversation. There's a statement about seafood, and if you read the the fine line, it says, by seafood, we also mean fish. And a bunch of us were upset, like, but yeah, what about the poor landlocked people? Can't they have trout? Can't they have catfish? And they said, yeah, read the line underneath. Oh, okay, they can. (laughs) When they say seafood, they mean seafood and fish, and I don't know why they were trying to save two words, seafood and fish. Okay, if I got in trouble for that, though, I'm going to be upset that I (laughs) clarified that for you. But really, how much trouble could I get in for clarifying? I mean, we'll stand up and say we needed the clarification because we couldn't read the fine print. (laughs) I'll come back and cut that one question out for you. (laughs) I'm really not. I've had my wrist slap several times already. And I'm, do you know I can't fire me because I'm a volunteer? (laughs) That makes it nice. So oil, does oil help with the absorption of some nutrients? Well, not just oil, but fat. So we have fat soluble vitamins. And so when you're, if, if you had a super low fat diet, it sort of prevents some of the 
oil-based mm -hmm. nutrients, vitamin A, D, E, and K, from being emulsified and having enough emulsifiers around to know that there's fat that needs to be absorbed as, as well as the nutrients. So yeah, I. so here's a, a picky point. Um, I went by too fast to show this, but in our American Heart Association paper about patterns, we actually mm -hmm. dinged low fat vegan and we gave mm -hmm. high fat vegan a higher mark. And that's partly because of those vitamins. So if you have a super duper, I, there's some, some very prominent cardiologists in the world, Dean Ornish, uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, Michael Grieger likes this, uh, Neil Bernard, there's a guy in Santa Rosa, sorry, I'm blocking on your name. They help a lot of people, but they're very strict, low fat vegans. And I, I have found in the American Heart Agrees that having some avocados and nuts and seeds and olive oil on your salad dressing actually helps lower blood triglycerides and, and keeps your diet from being too high in carbs. So I'm a, I'm a high fat plant-based vegan kind of person, partly for those nutrients, but also partly because of the balance between carbs and fats in the diet. That makes sense. So what would you quantify as low versus high fat? Just the range doesn't have to be precise. Yeah, no. So the uh, the one, the names that I just gave have for a long time proposed a 10% fat diet. Gotcha. So picture that 20%, they probably wouldn't consider low. 30% was a fat guideline for a long time in the US until they saw that people on a Mediterranean diet, which was more like 35 or 40% fat was helpful for addressing diabetes or prediabetes, partly because protein stays pretty similar and whatever isn't fat is carb. Mm -hmm. and so if you go as low as 10% fat, you're eating a lot of carbs. And it, it's just hard to get, make those all healthy carbs with fiber. Right. Stop there. That makes sense. Okay, since we are still on the topic of fat, <laughs> I know avocados are healthy and are high in fiber, but they are high in fat and my cholesterol is high. Are they okay for me to eat? They're high in unsaturated fat. They do not have saturated. So animal products tend to be high in saturated fat. The exceptions would be coconut oil, palm oil, and some other, the tropical oils tend mm -hmm. to be high in saturated fat, but not, not, veg, not nuts and seeds. The nuts and seeds and avocados and fish are very low in saturated fat. And that's what raises your blood cholesterol. Right. And this question about nuts is very similar. Are there any nuts that I need to avoid if I have high cholesterol? Uh, I mean, to be honest, macadamia nuts are a little higher, but I have to show you what I have on my desk here. I actually have chocolate covered academia nuts. So um, that, <laughs> that's my advice. My you just don't eat the whole can, right? In one right. sitting every day. A can a, day. <laughs> a can a day is all they ask. Isn't that an old almond thing? Um, anyway, so yeah, so putting that back up. So most of them are unsaturated. The nuts are unsaturated. Um, and what I would actually prefer is the different, like if I put up a chart of all the protein and fiber and fat in almonds, cashews, peanuts, which, which technically are a legume, uh, what else have I, I've got pecans back there. I've got another kind. They're, they're all slightly different, um, but not different enough to make a real important substantive health change. So what do I prefer? Oh my God. So I put pecans in my kick butt wheat berry salad and I have walnuts pretty much every day in my steel cut oats or whatever muesli I'm having. And I put cashews on my Mediterranean salad when I make that. And I could put the other nuts, but I, I really like those specific tastes mm -hmm. on those dishes. And if I like the taste, I'm more likely to eat it more often than if, I, oh, this one has one more gram of fiber. I don't quite <laughs> like it as much, but I'm dead set on giving my fiber number up. But it would be up higher if I ate the thing I like more often. Right. So not enough of a difference, no. Excellent. I think that covers all the questions that we had that were relevant um, coming through. And I do appreciate all of your wisdom and everything that you've shared with us today. I love this idea of 
food has to taste good. We have to like yeah. it. So instead of demonizing, especially whole foods, look at what else we're surrounding them with and reach for those plants. That was such a great takeaway message. Instead of what? With what? Yep. Okay, everybody. Right. Nice to almost meet you. Amy and Michelle, <laughs> nice to work with you. <laughs> Onward. Yes. yes. Amy, do you have any other thoughts? No, just thank you so much for coming on today. Um, people in the comments are just thanking you. They appreciate just how real and honest that you are. And it's such a refreshing, um, you know, to have that in the nutrition space. So you're greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yay. Eat well, be well. Yes, indeed. Bye now. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody.